Okay, do we have any questions for the panelists? Back there. I teach at a 1,000 level class at the community college, and I've noticed that I can tell the difference between my young students and my old students because my young students show more intergender traits. And I was wondering if you had noticed this and what your thoughts are. But of course, all of my students are old. <laughs> right. So, I uh, know, just joking, of course, especially if you're one of my students. <laughs> so, I truly believe that there is a generational shift with respect to the importance of, sorry, <laughs> to the importance uh, of the necessity of adopting a binary identity as male or female. Um, I think that shift is occurring with respect to sexual orientation. The importance of saying I am straight or I am gay or I am bisexual. I think there's much, a much more comfort among younger people with the sense of both of fluidity concerning sex, gender, and gender identity. So I completely agree with you. Thoughts? Oh, oh. I think that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but I see Anne with a microphone, so I'm going to her. No, I'm just going to, I'm going to read you some, I, I've been live tweeting this, and now I have a, a response from a tweeter, I don't know who it is, <laughs> but I think it's aimed at you. So I tweeted, can, can the law accommodate a model of sex gender as in between? And someone just um, uh, said, no, not without trampling on the sex protection of women, a historically oppressed class. So I'm wondering what your response to that is. Does that make sense? Look, uh, what is important, <laughs> what, what is important in, in my vision, in my theory uh, of sex gender is in between, is I in no way want to undermine or deny an individual's choice to self-identify as male or female. Moreover, I just want to expand the world of, of, of narratives, gender narratives that the law recognizes. It seems to me that the most important area of law uh, that has to remain a vigilant uh, were the law to move in this direction is the law that guards against discrimination. So discri anti-discrimination law, which now protects on the basis of sex, which some courts have extended to include sexual orientation, now the word sex, were one to adopt my approach, would include discrimination based on being a man, being a woman, or being any other uh, uh, number of categories that are meaningful to particular individuals as describing who they are and on which basis an employer or uh, the owner of housing bases discrimination on. So I do not think that it undermines protection of women. I think it expands the protection to a broader group of people. I was curious, um, when you look at other cultures, like for example, um, Egypt, ancient Egyptian or Greek or Hebrew cultures, and you have um, like, for example, eunuchs or that sort of language who were identified as a third gender right. or a, a third part of society, how does that relate to your idea of uh, community and what you see coming forward? So, I mentioned the community of Hijraz, the um, uh, a trans community in South Asia, which is composed of people who are deemed a third sex and are deemed to have sacred powers. So it's good in my understanding that one has a member of the Hijra community at a marriage because it supposedly helps to bless the marriage. It seems to me that my drawing changes profoundly in instances in which the notion of sex includes a third group of people. I'm not sure what the configuration looks like. I'm not sure it's a triangle as opposed to two end nodes. 
I just know that the meaning of bodies and the meaning of, what it, uh, of, a, of a sense of gender identity has got to be different in a society where there is truly an, uh, an acceptance of a third sex. I'm, again, I have not thought carefully enough as to what might my picture look like. Does that answer your question? That's right. So I was wondering what you'd say to the idea that medicine might possibly gain the ability to uh, perform sexual reassignment that is both reversible um, and outwardly at least seamless. I might take a stab at that. Um, in terms of intersex, the notion has been to actually, I mean, that has been the goal, if you will, right? And I think 50, 60 years now of surgical technique has shown how very far off they are. Um, medicine is very good at removing things. It is quite poor at adding things back. And when you consider um, the complexity of nerves and tissue um, and other things, I think that the idea that something could be created where there would be no sign of the intervention um, or a kind of reversibility is just not within the realm of medicine. I won't say never, but I think we're so far off from that given what I know of intersex, which again is they're not necessarily the same kinds of um, interventions that um, adults might have, you know, or undergo. But it's um, the, one of the chief complaints of people who have undergone these kind of interventions is that they actually produce genitalia, for example, that are so atypical um, that it, it's not even resembling um, what, what, what one might imagine to be um, gender typical genitalia with a huge amount of functional issues as well. So uh, I have a quick question, if that's okay, um, which is, um, as I was, I was thinking about this, and it's a kind of another version of the tweet, I think a little bit less confrontational, uh, which is to say, um, when we hear about, uh, Katrina talks about how dynamic and interactive testosterone is, and, and Terry about, well, this, you know, these, these circles radiating out, but this is culturally specific at a particular time and place, and, and it's a complex tapestry that's fleeting. And I just, the lawyer in me the, that imagines myself as a judge, uh, you know, panics mm -hmm. <laughs> and wants to flee <laughs> um, because the law wants ground, right? Mm -hmm. It wants a self. It wants a proxy for punishment and reward. Um, and so, um, the, you know, I think both of your presentations suggest a world in which the law looks away from these differences in some kind of a way mm -hmm. or, um, or opens up. Uh, different possibilities, and there are two different ways one might do that. One is to defer to an individual's self-identifications. Mm -hmm. Another is to ignore the differences mm -hmm. altogether, and I'm wondering what either of you has to say about choosing between those mm -hmm. paradigms. I'm just going to let you go, sure. Okay. No. So, it seems to me that I've suggested that under my vision, the major function that the law continues to serve with respect to recognition of gender is in the realm of anti-discrimination. And in the realm of anti-discrimination, um, it seems to me that the way one begins to recognize the categories that you have to protect are through considering individual narratives. Um, so, um, that is the way that, so where law remains important. I readily admit that there are many areas of law where sex gender information is currently collected where I think it doesn't need to be collected. So let's take a simple example, driver's licenses. Given that every driver's license has a picture on it, which enables a police officer to identify whether the person or the person at the airport why bother having a gender marker on a driver's license? What function does it serve? Um, and I want to suggest it serves very little function unless you happen to be a trans person who is presenting in a way that at least culturally 
seems to conflict with the gender indicator on the driver's license, and then it causes you problems. So I think there's a very strong argument for getting rid of the gender marker on driver's licenses. What about birth certificates? Now that becomes a little more interesting because some might say, well, you know what, for purposes of public health records and keeping longitudinal uh, uh, control over uh, 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 gender trends with respect to disease, whatever, we need to know what gender people, what sex people are at birth. Having said that, one could clearly keep that information in hospital records that get reported to public health agencies and not necessarily mark it on a birth certificate. That is, the, the uses of birth certificates um, in some realms at least, um, uh, there is no need to actually mark the birth certificate with the gender marker. Mm. I, I want to answer that maybe within the narrow confines of sports specifically. Um, the reason for these decades-long sex testing policies has been in, in order to protect uh, women athletes and um, women's competition. It's not something that's actually been uh, at the top of the concern list of women athletes. In other words, they're not looking for protection of the category. And so to me then the question becomes, is this operating to fulfill some other need? Because you don't hear a lot of worry from women athletes about men infiltrating or that kind of concern. Their concerns are more um, narrowly on their own performance. Um, but there have certainly been arguments made, and I think it's time for a really careful and complicated conversation about the wisdom of sex segregation in sports and when that might make sense or not. If we don't have sex segregation, then the kinds of things that I'm talking about become moot. We don't need to determine who's male or female. And I can imagine a kind of blowback, even if not verbally, in your minds right now of, whoa, you know, women will never win, and I mean, all kinds of things. Um, but the truth is we don't know. All we know is that um, despite Title IX and other things, women have not had the same kind of um, attention and support in athletic endeavors. And we also have examples where we use different kinds of metrics, not sex, but for example, weight in boxing or wrestling, and that that might be appropriate for some sports. So I think it's time for a larger conversation about why why it seems so shocking to think that sex segregation um, would make the sports world explode if we, if we got rid of it. And one quick addition, there's a um, really lovely former Olympian named Bruce Kidd who does work in Canada and is um, very critical of these policies as well. And he has argued for precisely gender self-identification and that's all. You say you're a man, you say you're a woman, and that should be enough. Um, in Olympic and other competition, you have to prove nationality, age, and other things, and, and sex is one of those things. And for him, you do an attestation. At this moment in time, I identify as male or female. Um, uh, I am not deceiving any, you know, blah, 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 blah. So there's certainly someone suggesting that as a model. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Cliff, I think your comment about the judge who wants to shield himself from the choices that would be involved is really a much broader discussion that needs to happen along the lines of what was just suggested in a way. And that is the broad problem that law deals with so many different categorical line drawings, some of which may appropriately be grounded in sex or gender identity, others which may not be, and many of those which may or may not be involved discretionary judgments if a different kind of process is to be followed. And it seems to me that the challenge that all of this raises is the difficulty of setting up a process that can distinguish between some kind of invidious discrimination or uh, other kind of unjust impact on grounds of sex or gender versus those situations in which there is some relevance to the distinction which the law has recognized. So, for example, my retirement program requires me to withdraw a certain amount of money uh, each year grounded in the value of my holdings at that time. 
the amount I can withdraw or re be required to withdraw depends upon whether I'm married. Um, <laughs> and oh. if I'm married and my spouse is the sole beneficiary, um, I'm required to withdraw less than if I am acting as a single person. That kind of distinction, although in this case it's focused on the marriage concern and therefore may ultimately not be relevant to this conversation, it could be. Um, and there are many such distinctions that are drawn. Right. And the challenge to the law, it seems to me, is to try to begin to distinguish the kind of thinking that was just reflected, that is the need for identifying a legitimate purpose in the distinction versus those which are ultimately grounded in bias. No, I think. So I have a couple of questions about, um, uh, and, and maybe each of you can answer this in sort of different ways, what the uh, legal and cultural implications would be for a person's right to privacy if we were to explode this binary system uh, of gender or sex and recognize a complete spectrum, for example, um, what, what happens in the sports context with gyne gynecological exams um, or uh, institutions, um, facilities. So I think, I mean, there are some difficult issue, issues here. Uh, the issue of sex segregated facilities, prisons, uh, dormitories, uh, though they are less sex segregated than they used to be. Um, uh, but prisons in particular uh, raise all kinds of serious concerns. One important observation is that one of the historical problems, uh, I think, of um, that has led to concerns about uh, sex-integrated prisons, say, has been far too much attention has been given to the individual bodies of inmates and far too little attention has been given to the responsibility of officials to oversee and protect inmates. So that in a way, uh, one ignores that the institution has obligations to make sure that people aren't raped in prison, whatever. And we know that in same-sex segregated prisons, people are raped all the time. So it's not like the concern somehow doesn't arise. Um, were there to be sex-integrated uh, facilities, these issues are particularly difficult for trans people, right? The issues mentioned earlier uh, with respect to, um, that Michael talked about. Um, how do we decide which uh, of two sex segregated facilities a particular person goes to, especially if they self-identify in the gender opposite of their birth body? These are hard issues. Mm -hmm. But I'll le I think a lot of the thinking needs to be directed at the officials as opposed to simply taking the status quo, which, me which is prisons are dangerous places, and what do we do with these people? Mm -hmm. okay, so we've got, uh, got five more minutes for two more questions. But one thing I want to say is after that, uh, the conversation continues. But not in the breaks, I know that we are all anxious. We all need out on this stuff. So there's no limit of questions that we would love to answer, I'm sure. And then also to email people. We get today. paid to do this. In fact. <laughs> so, uh, looking back, when I was a student in the 60s, I did not know how far sighted, forward looking, progressive I used to be in transcending, transcending the binary of male and female categories because whenever I used to be or we in the group used to be filling out forms where it said sex, we would be saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> now I look back and see. Yes. 
that's very funny. Um, so, Katrina, this actually kind of follows on what you said in terms of sports, this idea about why do we continue to have sex segregation. But it, it's actually a question for Terry, you know, and I love this work that you're doing and thinking with you over the years about the language. And, and the phrase in between, of course, strikes a deconstructionist always as a, as a good place to go because a lot of the juicy stuff, you know, in deconstructive thought has always been in between. You know, today seeing the diagram, it did make me wonder, and I, I love the way you're trying to say that no greater weight would be given to either node than sort of any point in between. But when you see it visually in that way, then for anybody who's not going to be one of the nodes, you know, ends up in that in between. And therefore, if it's like a non-normative masculine creature, let's just use that language, highly problematic, you know, then you already have them sort of to the right of the male node as if the, the attractive force is heading towards that other female node. It seems to me that there might be something possibly problematic. I like in between, but I wonder if we need other things that could circle around or would be on the other side or the far side of or even break against the idea of the human that some people might want to identify as, you know, cheetah person or I, right. I don't know I, what I, that, you right. know what I mean? Right. So that was it's mentioned whether, earlier, right? Yeah. That I think, I forgot who it was, but maybe it was Lisa or someone who said that, you know, that there are people who in fact self-identify in completely agendered, non-gendered terms. And I am completely open to a richer vision. Maybe it's a three-dimensional vision that my one plane only deals with mm -hmm. those aspects of human identity related to sex, gender. Maybe, again, I'm just trying to sort of suggest ways of seeing it. What I, what I am convinced of is we need to disabuse ourselves of the idea that there are real males and yes. real females. Yeah. And that's the one thing that my drawing is aiming towards. Yes. Let me say one other thing. Um, so a lot of this thinking developed in reading sort of postmodern feminist theory, people like Elizabeth Groves who, and others who have talked about the in-between for a long time, right? And for me, as much as I enjoyed that literature and as much as it has influenced me, I just think trying to develop legal arguments based on postmodern theory is very hard. And therefore, when I really, I think through Lisa's work, first discovered that there's a science, that there is a science which in a sense can support what I think is, uh, is a vision of in-between, it became incredibly attractive to me. This is in part in response to Bill's comment. There is no question in my mind that were law to take account to acknowledge dynamic systems theories, in particular here in the realm of sex and gender, it, there's no simple way to do that because it's a complex theory. But that is not to say that the law shouldn't try to do it if, in fact, that, that is a more accurate science in understanding sex and gender than the more traditional binary visions that science has given us up to now. Things in the world are complicated, and sex gender may be complicated, and the law begins to struggle with how we deal with complicated phenomena. Uh, well, uh, join me in thanking the panelists, please. Yeah.